I hope what you've seen here is that with correlational methods where we simply have observed the world, causality is not particularly clear. We can't really know if A causes B, whether B causes A, or whether some third variable, some C variable, is actually causing both A and B. Now, in the original Latin, this fallacy is known as cum hoc ergo propter hoc, which just means correlation does not imply causation. Now, imply is used very specifically here. This means correlation does not necessarily entail causation between two things. We've already seen with ice cream that just because two things are correlated doesn't mean one is causing the other. It could be that some third variable is responsible for the changes in each. Those of you who are as nerdy as I am probably know XKCD already. I want to put up this cartoon because I thought it was especially apropos. Now, if you've never seen XKCD, I recommend checking it out. Hopefully, after this class, you'll get some of the statistically related jokes. Now, with all XKCD cartoons, there's what's called a mouse over. So once you've read the comic, you just hover your mouse, and you'll get a little extra bit of text. Now, Randall, the author, is pretty spot on here. Correlation doesn't imply causation, but it sure makes us want to infer some type of causal relationship. Now, this is something that our brains are simply set up to do. When two things co-occur, it's very useful for us to see that there's some kind of relationship between them. But be careful. As good scientists, we have to be careful to know when we can actually infer causation and when we're simply making a speculation at some causal structure. Now, when we do science, we typically would like to make inferences about the causes that are occurring in the world. And correlational methods aren't going to be able to do that for us which is why we use experimental methods when there really is an importance placed on determining what causes what in the world. Now, experiments come in lots of different varieties, and in this class, we'll see many of them. But there are two very central characteristics of any true experiment that we can talk about. The first characteristic is manipulation, that the experimenter has manipulated some independent variable to see the effect it has on the dependent variable. Now, there's a couple new words in there, so we want to take a sidestep here and talk about what we mean by variable, independent variable, and dependent variable. First, a variable is any characteristic or condition that changes or has different values for different individuals. Now, this could be many different types of things. Could be the age of a person, their gender, height, whether they're a Facebook user or not, someone's exam score. These are all variables because different people have different values on them. Now, the independent variable in an experiment is the variable that is manipulated or changed by the experimenter. When we talk about independent variables, we'll usually talk about the levels of the independent variable, which refers to the different types of treatments or conditions that individuals experience. For instance, in the experiment when we were looking at caffeine versus no caffeine before an exam, caffeine level is the levels of the independent variable, so caffeine or no caffeine. Now, the dependent variable in an experiment is what is measured. So this is presumably the variable we think depends on the independent variable. So going back to that exam and caffeine example, the independent variable is whether we give someone caffeine or not, and the dependent variable would be their exam score. So in any true experiment, we have some sort of manipulation to see how the independent variable will affect the dependent variable. This is, of course, a critical distinction between a true experiment and a correlational research methodology. In a true experiment, we're actually manipulating or changing the world to see what consequences it has. Whereas in correlational work, we're simply observing what's happening in the world and trying to make inferences about what is going on. Now, it might seem very straightforward that to really understand the world, we need to change it or make manipulations. But this idea is relatively young within the philosophy of science. Now, it's attributed most to a man named John Stuart Mill, who I've mentioned before, a very famous 19th century British philosopher, political economist, civil servant. He was an influential contributor to social theory and political theory, but for our purposes here, we're going to focus on his work in the systems of logic. Now, the systems of logic had a very specific and influential chapter, which is the canons of experimental inquiry. Now, the canons, and there are several, and I'll tell you about three of them, are methods for knowing about the world in such a way that we can infer about the causal structure of things. Now, causes can't be observed. We can only observe the consequences of causes. So these are methods that allow us to pull apart what's happening in the world 
given that we can't actually observe an actual cause, but can only observe the consequences of causes. First, the direct method of agreement states that if two or more instances of the phenomenon under investigation have only one circumstance in common, the circumstance in which alone all the instances agree is the cause or effect of the given phenomenon. Now, this is 19th century British philosophy writing, so that may be a little impenetrable, but let's actually lay this out diagrammatically, and it should be a little more clear. So here's the direct method of agreement in a diagram. Suppose we have circumstance A where some phenomenon occurs. I like to use a chemistry example in this one because I think it makes clear what the method of agreement is really stating. So imagine the phenomenon occurring is some liquid turning blue when we add different things to a mixture. So in circumstance A, the liquid turns blue, and also in circumstance B, the liquid turns blue. Now we've added a number of different things to each of these vials. In circumstance A, we have factors 1, 2, 3, and 4. These can be different liquids, if you like. In circumstance B, we have factors 6, 7, 8, and 9. And in both A and B, we have factor 5. Now notice, by the direct method of agreement, if factor 5 is the only factor in common between these two circumstances in which the phenomenon occurs, factor 5 must be the cause or the effect of the phenomenon. Now this last bit is a little bit hard to see, but just by observing that factor 5 is in common with circumstance A and B, it's not enough for us to say that factor 5 causes the phenomenon only to show that there is some causal connection between factor 5 and the phenomenon. Now, given temporality, we know when we add mixtures together that there is some temporal or time-based sequence. If the liquid is not blue until I add factor 5, well, we could be pretty sure that factor 5 is causing the phenomenon, the blueness, rather than the blueness causing me to add factor 5. Now, a second canon of experimental inquiry is the method of difference, and this is probably the one that you'll see most in psychological science. If an instance in which the phenomenon under investigation occurs and an instance in which it does not occur, have every circumstance in common save one, that one occurring only in the former, the circumstance in which alone the two instances differ, is the effect, or the cause, or an indispensable part of the cause, of the phenomenon. Now again, this should be made more clear through a diagram. So in the method of difference, here we have circumstance A and circumstance B yet again, but notice in circumstance A, the phenomenon occurs, but in circumstance B, it does not occur. Now let's imagine that these two circumstances have in common factors 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And factor 5 only occurs in circumstance A, but not B. Given this observation, again, we can say that factor 5 is somehow causally related to this phenomenon. And if we were adding liquids to a tincture, we can assume that factor 5 is causing the phenomenon rather than the phenomenon causing me to add factor 5. But notice again that the method of difference is identifying the factor connected to the causation, not necessarily the order or the direction of the causation. Finally, the method of concomitant variation states that whatever phenomena varies in any manner whenever another phenomenon varies in some particular manner, is either a cause or an effect of the phenomenon, or is connected with it through some fact of causation. Now to see this in a diagram, I'll simply return to that plot of ice cream sales and murders. Certainly, we can see that there is concomitant variation as ice cream sales increase, so too do murders, and we've already stated that this is likely explained by the temperature of a city. So these two are related through some fact of causation, not necessarily one causing the other, but some third factor that's resulting in the increase in both. So, knowing what we do now about these methods of manipulation, we can see that manipulation is a powerful way to understand or piece apart what is happening in nature.